Hey, this is Donnie, and right now I'm playing uh, four tables of 510 Element on full tilt. Uh, all four tables are deep stacked, so uh, I think it should be a more interesting video because of that. And um, I'm sort of picking up where um, where Isaac left off, because um, he was doing his uh, sort of climbing through the ranks uh, video series, and he uh, wasn't able to finish that before he left Poker Savvy, so... Right now, I'm just going to be um, sort of continuing continuing from where he left off, and I'm going to start off with 510 and then do 1020 and probably uh, finalize it with a 2550 video. Um, so I, I think 510, well, maybe not, mm, around 2, 4, 3, 6, and then even 510 is really where you start to see a lot of players who are basically playing poker for a living in these games, you know, you know, at 510, I don't know, I mean, I, it's hard to say what percentage, but, you know, at 2550, a majority of the player pool is professional poker players, like, vast majority. Same thing goes for 1020, probably. 510, probably a little bit less so of the case, but still, still quite a bit. Um, so it sort of changes the dynamic as, as you move up in stakes, knowing that most, a lot of these people who are playing, you see these guys, you know, they're playing, like, pretty much all day, uh, playing, putting in tons of hands, like 2,000, 3,000 hands a day, and they're doing this for a living. And, you know, generally people sort of would shy away from those types of players, think think that it's they're not the type of people that they want to play against. Um, but the truth is, a lot of times these guys, these grinders, end up being very easy to play against because they play so many tables, they can't really, they don't really know how to adjust, they, they won't, they won't, uh, they won't pick up on things you're doing very well. Um, you know, and they have very specific tendencies and, and things like that. And and if you're just if you stay more observant than them, you're generally going to do fine against them, even if they're even if they're you know have more experience and they play this pretty much all day. Um, there's still plenty of room to to beat them. And you know, a lot of people ask like, well, what's the difference really between five ten ten twenty or between three six five ten? Or two, four, and three, six. Any of those, um, and I'd say, you know, it's there's, it's really just what you would expect. It's just everyone just gets a little bit, be slightly better at each level. It's not like, it's no, no, nothing's going to shock you about moving up in stakes. It's just going to be more aggressive. People are going to read hands better. Um, there's, it's not like they, they understand some specific concept better than, than uh, three, six players do. It's just more a general. You know, 510 will just be a generally more aggressive, more difficult game to play. That's pretty much it. And um, I would also recommend, if you are moving up in stakes, maybe don't play the deep tables. If you know, if you're if you're trying to take a shot at 510, and you have let's say a $30,000 roll or something, you might want to stay away from the deep tables just because it's you know you can potentially lose a lot more and. You never really want to be in a situation where if you lose a big pot at the game you're playing, it'll devastate you or crush your bankroll or anything like that. But for this video, I think it's better to do 5-10 deep because generally more interesting situations come up. And I think 100 big blind strategy has been talked about endlessly to death pretty much by you know every high stakes player and every video instructor on every video instruction site. So hopefully I'll be able to do something a little bit different with this video. So far really nothing has happened of any interest. It's nice that one of these tables is um, three-handed too. That's it also will be a fun change in dynamic from the six-handed tables. I mean... This guy, Tabansi, Tabansi, whatever, he um he only opened to twenty two here, so I'm gonna call with Ace Nine. It's just get laying me a really good price, and as always, I advocate you open four X in the small blind. So that's what I'm gonna do here with the pocket fives. And he re raises, he re raises small, so I'm gonna call. If he had, if he had made it one forty or something, I might have folded. But for only one seventeen, I'm getting a good enough price. And that's a pretty bad flop, but actually, 
Uh, you know, if he had bet a normal size, if he had bet like 150, I might have decided to make a play and try to check raise bluff him here. But I don't know, the 88, it seems almost like he's trying to invite the check raise. Uh, not really sure. And once again, I'm going to call here. I'm actually just going to flat call here with the nines. I think a lot of people might three bet. In these situations where you're deciding whether or not to three bet middle pair, one of the most important factors to think about really, I'm just going to request time. You got to really make it clear why you're three betting. And it's, you can't just say, well, you know, pocket nine's way ahead of his range, blah, blah, blah. You got to sort of think about it, the alternatives, what you can actually have happen. When you re-raise, it's going to be very hard to win a big pot unimproved with your hand if you're if you're at all deep stacked. When you flat call here, you can you can win the pot by flopping an overpair. I mean it's less likely, but you know, in a flop like this I can lead out. Or, you know, you can get in a multi way pot potentially with a hand that can flop a set and that's obviously profitable. And hold on, right here, this is probably this is a pretty interesting river card. I mean it's not it's not a terrible card, but it's definitely not a great card. With the backdoor flush getting there. I think it's definitely a bet though. I'm gonna bet 350. I'll go back to that nine sand in a second. There's definitely a check on the turn with the nines here on the lower right. Um, you know, you, I let out on the flop because my hand's not nearly good enough to check check raise, but it's also probably a little bit too good to just check call if it gets bet in the call. So I think a lead is a nice, you know, middle ground there, and that's just like the wor worst turn card possible. Now it's a now there's a one card to a straight and and potential flush out there, so I'm just gonna fold my overpair. Um, but back to the reason why you're you know re raising big pairs or, or middle middle pairs or not. Um, you know, sort of the cutoff of, of the hands that I would value raise there, I'd probably value raise, you know, jacks re raise jacks plus maybe tens. Um, and the reason being is that with those hands, you can potentially win a big pot without improving, which is something that's very, a very important sort of qualification for what we're deciding whether or not you want to re-raise a pocket pair, basically. But with pocket nines, there's way more there's way more flops you don't like. Um, there's way more ways you're going to get pushed off the pot if, if you re-raise and you get called. So you should be a little bit more likely just to flat call and play, play the hand kind of slow. And right here, this guy, he re-raised me um, from the blind, and he bet two streets. Now he checks to me. Um, oh, almost sat out there. Um, and how he ch he checks that river, um, is definitely a value bet. If he if he ends up having like king queen or something like that, he's obviously gonna really quickly call here. But he can easily put me on. Oh yeah, that's. I mean, that's just an awful check call, but whatever. Um, since I can't have like ace of hearts, I don't, I don't really like that play. Um. I mean that I don't really mind that he had Ace King there. It's still it's a very standard and easy value bet. Um, I'm just gonna fold this 10-9 here. You know I might have the bet, like somebody might say, well you have showdown value because you have a pair of tens, but on that type of board texture, you really I, I really probably only had eight outs maximum, and uh, I think that was an easy fold. Um, but with the King Jack, you know that's something you might see actually more at lower stakes. You know at 25-50, I'd never expect somebody or higher. I'd really never expect somebody to ever check that river with Ace King to me. So maybe it would be a, bit, a little bit of a better decision to check behind there, King Jack. Um, but I think it's pretty standard play to call down there with, with King Jack and then make a tough decision on the river, assuming it blanks off. Um, you know, he can easily be making making a double barrel with a hand like Ace Jack or Ace Queen with a heart, or King, Queen Jack, or he could just have total air, or he could just have Ace of Hearts with any other card. I'm gonna cold four bet here. Now this play just looks ridiculously strong, and it puts puts this oh yes guy in a really tough spot. Um, even even if he has a hand as good as Jack's there, what the, what is he supposed to do? You know he can't he can't shove. Shoving is just terrible. Well, he's gonna shove for two thousand after I make it two eighty. No, he can't really do that. Uh, or his option the other option is to flat call and see what happens, see what flops, and then when he does that, I can take advantage of that because I can just bet him off off his hand every time an ace or a king flops because he's probably just going to check fold in those cards. You know, or even if he has ace king, what is he going to do? Is he going to, is he just going to five bet it? Is he going to expect me to six bet jam with, with garbage there? You know, those are the types of spots you got to look for 
when you're playing, especially shorthanded, not just six max, but really shorthanded games, it, it's even more important. You got to look for those spots where you can just be ridiculously aggressive and seem kind of like a lunatic, um, and 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 make these you know ridiculous sort of ridiculous plays like four betting with King Deuce off. But when you actually think about it, when you actually sort of oh god damn it, sorry, I almost timed out because my computer was lagging. You know, when you actually put, you got to sort of just put yourself in your opponent's shoes and you realize that you're actually making a really good play because if you were in his shoes with most of your hands, that you're, most of your range for three betting in that spot, you're going to be pretty upset when you get four bet. It's not going to be a, a good spot for you. I'm going to sort of bet small here because I think there's a really good chance he just has ace high. Don't want to blow him out of the pot. So I'm only going to bet a little bit higher than half pot. Oh, that's a great card for me, probably. I think. I just think he has. A, he might have a king. He might have ace king a lot, given the line he took. And I snap call. Wow. That was just an interesting play. I mean, he's really not representing much there, because how could he have check called down with a flush draw after re-raising pre-flop? Um, yeah, I just can't, I can't say that I like his play there. <laughs> See, I figure he would have bet the turn with a nine, so I'm gonna call here with the eights. I think there's a good chance he has a seven. Okay, that's fine. Ooh. I can't call here. I'm very tempted to, but I definitely could not call down here. That would have been terrible. All right, so I'm just going to check behind here with the sevens. Um, I can't really imagine getting called by worse and I have a good amount of showdown value. And he did have a better hand, which he probably would have called with. You know, I'm going to actually sit in this game just because it looks like this table in the upper left is about could break. Um, so I'm just going to keep this. I'm going to sit out here just for now, and then if, if one of these tables breaks, I'll just be like my backup on Gwen. Yeah, I'm going to four bet him again. Um, a lot of times when I'm coaching my students and they'll ask me if they should make some a certain, you know, really aggressive play, I'll often just tell them that for the duration of the session that I'm coaching them, just make every possible absurd over aggressive play that they can possibly make. Um, just because in the future they're obviously not going to be playing quite that aggressive, um, but it'll just sort of drill into their head that they can actually that you, you know you'll actually watch and you'll be able to see that it it does work quite a bit of the time to just to just be relentlessly aggressive and sort of not really hold back and not really let up on your opponents because you know a lot of people when they you know they'll, they'll four about somebody and they won't do it again for like another 30 minutes because they'll say oh I just did it to him he might suspect I'm doing it again yeah but really how often does that actually happen most of the time people they just they just give up most of the time I mean obviously is, is you know opponent dependent I'm I wouldn't wouldn't advocate you just doing it to anyone but when you get when you start playing with people, you know you really should just try to push them, push them, see how far, how much they can take, how much abuse they'll actually take before they snap. So pretty much every time OES TG PFA re raises this uh, the button, and I'm in the big blind, I'm gonna four bet. Sounds like an exploitable strategy, doesn't it? Well, it's because it is.
Now, uh, uh, it's becoming more and more um, common when you watch high stakes games that people, their, their, um, their continuation bet size and re-raise pots is generally very small. And the reason for that is it's basically a function of, of several things. One, the one reason is that people generally play very straightforward in in big pots like that, and in, in three bet and four bet pots. Um, well, not three bet pots, but four bet pots definitely people play very straightforward. Um, they tend to. Not saying it always happens, but quite often it does. And because of that, you don't necessarily always need to bet big to get people to fold on your C-bet. Um, you're better off just balancing it all in general by just betting small. And another reason is simply just it's a matter of stack size to pot ratio. You know, you, you do not have to bet that big from a theoretical sense to get your entire stack in the middle by the river. Um, and most of the time, you know, sort of old school logic would have you believe that, well, you can't, you can't bet small because you got to protect against draws and blah, blah, blah. And while it is, like, somewhat of a concern from a theoretical sense, you know, it's far outweighed by being able to manipulate your opponents with smaller bet sizes. It's much more important to be able to do that. And it's much more important that you have, that you can, you can sort of use variable bet sizes and, and especially when you when you have air in, in in really big pots, if you can you know if you can bet just like a third of the pot on the flop in certain spots, it's going to be very profitable for you to do that. All right. So now I'm actually going to call it because I have a reasonable hand. Now this is pr I would not really tell anyone to do this. Do not cold call three bets with nine eight suited. It's generally a bad idea to do that. Um, now his his continuation betting range here is pretty is pretty slim. Uh, I'm gonna float him here. That's a terrible card for me, because now I mean I have to bet bet it anyway. But if he, oh, fuck, I really think he might have an ace. All right, well I'm gonna bet it because at least I'll get him to fold his total air hands. But I'd much rather see just a, a deuce on the turn. Then I know I can get a full ace high. But now I think, yeah, yeah, he has an ace. He's going to call. There we go. Yeah, there it is. See, I mean, my call on the flop is like is very, very obviously profitable there. Even though I, you know, from a, you know, a, a simple mind might look at that and say, well, you had only, you know, you only, you only had three outs, therefore your call on the flop was, was bad. But no, in fact, actually, uh, he actually only had only had three outs, unless he was planning on on barreling me there, uh, which I do not think he was trying to do. Most of the time, I'm going to win that pot because he's going to he's going to check. Oh fuck! I accidentally checked behind here. My computer's been lagging like crazy. Um, most of the time, he's just going to check behind, check that turn on the uh, on the queen queen five board with his hand. So you know, even though I have by far the worst of it, because I have a better sense of his range than, than he does mine. I'll be able to to actually uh, win that pot more often than he will. And here I'm just going to check with the top pair. Interesting play. So I got a table heads up going now. If this guy continues playing me.
Yeah, I'm just gonna pretty much relentlessly three about this guy. That's an all right flop for me. I mean, it's generally not a great flop to be c betting on, but the fact that I do have a gut shot and an overcard sort of improves it. And plus, the fact that it's there's two suits out there, I can probably there's a good chance I can use the club to bluff. Maybe not always, but at least some of the time I can bluff on the club. And he raises, so I'm just gonna fold, obviously. So I got new headphones to make videos, new expensive Logitech headset, and I can't get it working, so I'm back to my old one, but I hope the quality is is alright. So not much going on in the six max tables. This is why I generally don't really like six max compared to heads up. Um, not that there's that much going on here, but at least you're constantly playing hands with six max. I mean, six max nowadays to me feels like full ring did like you know two years ago. It's just it's gotten sort of boring and nitty. See, that's the thing. Most regulars at higher stakes. Contrary to popular belief, are not, you know, super aggressive and and really tricky. Most of them are just really nitty. Most of them just they make lots of money because they can. They've learned how to read hands pretty well over the years, but they haven't necessarily learned how to really play poker very well. So they just tend generally tend to be very nitty. Um, that's how a lot of high stakes players play. Not I'm not talking about like the 200, 400 people. I'm talking about just like 10, 20. 2550. There's just a ton of mindless nits who can't, who just are extremely, extremely overrated, and they just play very simple, not very creative poker. Um, and it's funny because on multiple occasions, you know, I've been at a tournament table with some ca some like well-known cash game player. Not they don't even have to be well-known, just some some grinder, and um. And I'll see some tournament player make a stack off to this player in a spot that's just absolutely awful. And it might be somebody I know, and I'll talk to them about it. And they'll just be like, well, you know, I, I knew he was a cash game player, so I figured he had a really wide range there, and he could be bluffing. And it's just bizarre that so many people make the assumption about, about certain cash game players that because they are because they play 10-20 or 25-50 or even 5-10, that they're going to be really aggressive and, and really good. But it's just not always true. I really wish I had like Queen Jack here, because then I can I knew know I can go bet three streets. But with Jack Nine, it'd be kind of close by the river, whether I can bet it for value or not if the board keeps blanking off. I'm just talking about that hand I just played here, where I re-raised him with with the um, Jack Nine and the Jack flopped, just because you know against most players. Um, if I the dynamic that I have with this guy, I've just been pretty ridiculously aggressive against him. So normally I would I would Bet three streets against that type of guy, but with Jack Nine, it's pretty close. Given that his his calling range is going to be like is going to be Jack Ten plus like a hundred percent of the time, and then after that some other hands too. So here I just flopped the top two pair. I'm going to check raise and bet three streets unless he if he three bets a flop. Ooh, that would be a tough decision. What to do? I don't really think I can fold against a good player because they can know that they that they can have ace king and I can't have ace king because I flatted pre, so it means they could be bluffing there some of the time. But against this guy, who generally seems to be pretty, not or doesn't see, I mean I I could be wrong. He could be really good, but thus far he hasn't impressed. Um, not that he's done anything wrong. Um, 
but you know he's been sort of on the pat on on the passive side, I guess. So I wouldn't really, I, don't, I really wouldn't put him on a bluff if he three bet that flop. He has reconnected. Any checks. So now I'm gonna bet. Even though that eight puts up a one card straight, um, one card to a straight, I still have to go bet bet two streets. And if he raises, then I can fold. Uh, if he, so I'm gonna bet this river. If he takes, if he snap calls, I'm be, If he takes more than about two seconds, I'm. I'm good. Like I said, he snap called. And that is a tremendously terrible check by him on the flop. He actually checked behind there with a straight. I mean, wow. That could have just been because he was he was disconnected and it wasn't on purpose. But if it wasn't, then that was just atrocious. So this is a pretty clear flat call here with the threes, though if you're really deep, it actually can be pretty profitable to start three betting um, the small pairs, especially in position. Basically, what you're doing is you're setting up, you're setting up sort of a, uh, you're sort of setting yourself up for implied odds. Basically, you're you're creating a bigger pot, so when you win, if you do hit a set, you can potentially win a big pot um, because generally with small pairs, if you're like you know I'm talking like 500, 600 big blinds deep. It can it can be hard to actually stack a worse hand, you know, if even if you flop a set. And quite often, since people, what happens is, you know, people very, you know, they're generally very uh, adverse to getting stacked. They really hate getting stacked when they're that deep. So quite often, what will happen is, even if you do, you know, outflop something like pocket aces, you're not really going to like win a monster pot off them. Quite often, they might just, you know, you they bet the flop, you raise, they'll call. Then the turn will go like check back call, and then they might check fold the river. Whereas if it's hundred big blind stacks, they're never folding aces, no matter what happens. Um, but they might actually get away from the extra, you know, three hundred big blinds if uh, if you put in, you know, if you put if you put in a, a big a big raise and flop or something like that. I'm going to try to isolate this guy. I'm going to re-raise him with ace-jack suited. Now, this is something I don't usually do with ace-jack suited. Um, because it's sort of, if you, you sort of create some reverse implied odds when you re-raise with it, because generally people won't call you with, you know, worse aces. They'll usually only call with ace-queen, ace-king, or, you know, other random cards. But when you're deep and you've been really shitting on a guy, he, he, he could potentially call you a lot worse hands. And just you just want to sort of isolate um, some isolate him while you're in position. This is an easy shove. Um, when he three bets me there, shorthanded, ace queen, just stick him in. And he folds. Notice that he only had 455. Now I'm going to three bet here. The reason being that nobody expects you to three bet light here. Therefore, you should three bet light. Just generally when people are expecting you to three bet light, don't do it so often. When people are expecting you not to, you should do it quite often. That's a good guideline, good general rule.
and I'm going to 3-bed him. I'm going to make a kind of big raise because we're deep. I'm going to make a 135. Right, this guy really needs to grow a set of balls and 4-bet me one time. Now this is a pretty good flop for pocket sevens. About as good a flop as you can ask for without actually flopping a seven. Especially with a gut shot, I'm just going to call. There isn't much of a reason to do anything but calling that flop with the pocket sevens. And I'm going to call again, even though that queen hit. And now if he bets, I'll probably fold. It's a check. Definitely a check. Um... Now some, oh, hey, this guy is also named Donnie. And I can't really call here. I'm getting, I'm getting two and a half to one. You know, I'm four, I'm about four to one to hit it, hit a flush. But it's not a not, it's not a big flush draw, which sort of hurts me because you know those are gonna be in his range. He definitely has like king x of diamonds there, maybe even queen jack, queen ten, jack ten of diamonds, all those hands. Um, so because of that, I'm not actually gonna call there. With a flush draw, even though I it could have good implied odds, I'm not gonna call. Um, I'm going to 3-bet him here with Ace Queen. I'd say I flat here maybe 20% of the time, something like that. In this exact situation, 100 big blinds, cut off versus button. <laughs> it's funny, you really... I mean, if I was playing this this active free flop at, at 25.50, I would have been 4-bet so many times by now. But at 5.10, you really don't have that much of a worry, apparently. I mean, I don't know the stakes as well. Um, as I used to, because I haven't played five ten, uh, you know, like as a as a regular stake for quite a while now. But I seem to remember it being more aggressive. Maybe that was because I was less aggressive. I'm gonna call that small re raise. That's a good card for me. That's a really good card. Mm. Now that he bet 400, I'm kind of nervous that I'm beat. Mm. I think this is a very close fold here with Ace Jack. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, that card improved your hand. Um, So, why are you. If that card improved your hand, oh, I guess that guy was sitting out. Um, they would say, you know, if that card improved your hand, why would you, why would you check, you know, why would you fold if you called a flop? And the reason is that's that's a type of card that I think people would shut down on if they were bluffing, because it's so likely that I have a king, and he doesn't expect me to ever fold a king. But then again, it could just be that he's a complete idiot, and I got bluffed. Which is entirely a possible a possibility, but it's just a risk.
I've played with this guy, Jugador Jr. I've played with him at 2550, I'm pretty sure. I didn't know he was like a 510 grinder. I thought he was just some random guy. So I really look forward actually to moving moving up in these in these videos doing the 1020 and 2550 videos cuz I mean 510 just isn't really that fun. I mean most people are just pretty passive and and I don't know, there aren't that many lunatics. It doesn't doesn't make for videos quite as fun as as the higher stakes. Really. Actually, I don't know why I just clicked fold with the 7-6 off. I was, you know, I'm definitely going to re-raise that on the button. But I'm going to re-raise because this guy opened. I'm pretty sure I know who that is, by the way. But I'm not going to say it on the video because I don't know if he's anonymous or not. Um, that's a pretty bad flop for me to continue. Um, the fact that I also had 7 is a good reason to check behind that flop because... Um, you know, I still have showdown value even if he bets the turn, which he just did. I'm deciding whether I want to call or raise. I think I'm just going to call. Let's see what he does in there. Uh, I was thinking about shoving, but shoving's not really good there. Shoving doesn't really look bluffy. I don't think. I think just a nice, a nice bet like that size looks more bluffy. Now he's gonna call here with many pocket pair, pretty much above seven. What is he gonna raise with though? What in the fuck? I mean, this guy's just been such a passive bitch that I'm pretty tempted just to fold here because he hasn't really shown any capability of buffing. But at the same time, I sort of want to force him to, you know, I think I think he'll always shut down on a bluff if I call. So I'm just going to call um, because of that reason, just because I think he'll always shut down on a bluff. Let's, let's see if my prophecy holds true. That's a really bad card for me. Sick feeling that hit him. That's King Jack. Huh. Interesting card. I really need to know what he has. It's gonna drive me crazy. He claims to have had 5-6. I don't think I believe him. Well, 
if he if he did, was bluffing there, good for him. See, I, I just didn't think he'd follow up. I mean, I knew he wouldn't follow up on the turn on a bluff. And because of that, I sort of kept that read going. I didn't think he'd fire that river as a bluff. But it could be um, that he just saw that king as a good bluffing card and bet it. And I didn't really consider that. I don't know why. I just sort of thought if he had a bluff, he'd stop. Um, I didn't really sort of think that through very well. Um, I mean, if he had a bluff, then really good for him because he should know that the way he's been playing is going to make me basically play against him very, you know, basically give him a lot of credit if he starts putting in a lot of chips just because he has not done that at all. He has not made plays like that so far. So if, if he did actually bluff there, good for him. That was a good play. And he's not as much of a passive bitch as I called him. By the way, I'm sorry to that guy if you're, if you ever watch this video or if any of your friends tell you about this or anything like that. I'm sure you're not a passive bitch. I'm just name calling because playing 510 is sort of frustrating. So I'm going to go do I'm going to keep on with this video for like maybe two more two or three more minutes. It'll be a good 45 minute video. Um, hopefully, there'll be some more interesting situations. I don't know really what I was thinking folding that queen to eight. That was fucking terrible. What could he have had? He has to have rivered a king. And what king can he have? He can't have ace king. That's for sure. He can't have queen king. He has to have exactly king jack and decided to bluff the flop with it. Or he has a slow play, or he has like some ridiculously, strangely slow played... Um, trips. I can't believe I folded that river. That was an atrocious read by me. Now, I'm just thinking about it now after the hand finished about why that was so terrible. There's just so few kings he can have. He could have king-queen, but I don't think he'd check-raise the flop with that. I think he'd check-call down, thinking that I'm going to bluff at it like a lunatic. And he definitely didn't value bet. He didn't definitely didn't like check-raise queen-jack on the flop, check the turn, and bet that river. That's just absurd. Um, well, I definitely got owned in that hand because he made a bluff, which I really should have snapped off, and I didn't, so good for him. Alright, so I'm going to start sitting out in these tables. Um, as always, just post in the forum uh, if you have any questions or comments about the video. And let me know uh, what you think about my play, and if you think I need to change anything for the next video when I do the 1021. And uh, that's it. See you guys.